when darkness descends from the sky, evil will rise and spread across the land. There is no dark heart to the heart of evil, especially in the chaos. So, let's create a warrior without doubt. The Shadow Seven. For those of you who were left hanging on my last video's cliffhanger, welcome back, and for those of you who are new, welcome to my channel. But I do highly recommend going back and watching the first part of this series, as I'm pretty much going to dive right into things, picking up right where we left off at the end of the last video. But all you really need to know is that this is a hypothetical third game, continuing the story of fan-favorite spin-off games, Pokemon Coliseum and Pokemon Gale of Darkness, in my own reimagined version of the Ori region, the brand new story, new locations, new characters, and of course brand new Shadow Pokemon. But I'll be taking it a step further with the new class of Shadow Pokemon I came up with each inspired by one of the seven deadly sins. As the darkness within them has corrupted them beyond repair, mutating them into these malevolent new Shadow Warp forms most of which I already introduced in a previous video at the start of the month, but you'll learn even more about all of them and their context within this game in this video. Also, if you enjoyed the video, please don't forget to show your boy some love and hit that like button, leave a comment down below to let me know what you think, and most importantly, please subscribe to my channel so I can keep it growing. As most of you know by now, while the concepts and designs featured on my channel are all my own, I don't actually draw the artwork featured in my videos, as I have commissioned over 40 talented artists who I work with intimately throughout the creative process down to the tiniest of details so I could take you on these exciting journeys through my imagination. So please make sure to go follow and support all of them as well. Their links will be provided down below in the description. Anyways, let's get this party started. So the last video left off on Real Gam Tower after the hero Zion, aka you the player, just defeated Twyla and her Absol and Retri in a tag tournament. Twyla showed her true face and exposed yours as she revealed Zion to be a robot as she referred to them as a hunk of metal, causing a massive glitch as the video ended with a series of shots from the first game. The screen then cuts to Zion, whose eyes have activated and gone green, confirming them in fact to be some sort of robot. Twyla, who already was established in the Furin region as an incredible hacker and really good with technology after hacking robot battle brain Rob at the Battle Factory, attempts to do the same here with Zion while they're short-circuiting. But Mummion and Drekion quickly come in to defend Zion, and Twyla, after just losing the battle, currently doesn't have any Pokemon on her to help. Luckily, Zion quickly comes to before things escalate any further, wondering what happened. Twyla, or her dark side rather, starts laughing, saying, come on, how do you not know you're a robot? Zion, confused, naturally wants to say, no, I'm not, but before they can finish, looks at their hands and the lower half of their body, then at Mummion and Drekion, who look real sad, as it's clear they already knew, but obviously feel bad for their trainer who didn't. Zion then says, but how? I don't understand. What is my purpose? Twyla replies, you're the Shadow Slayer, the name says it all. You were designed to find and acquire Shadow Pokemon for people like me, as we, like Pokemon, can be corrupted. So none of us can be trusted. However, you have no heart. You're nothing more than a programmable henchman. But even you couldn't manage to be loyal. You went from being our biggest asset to the biggest pain in our- And then the screen starts to glitch again, as Zion continues the short circuit with memories after being overloaded with all this information. Drekion and Mummion seem worried as Twyla, with a big grin on her face, inches closer and closer, saying don't worry, we'll get you good as new, as Cypher henchmen start rushing into the room. The screen then glitches out and goes black. After a brief pause, you wake up back in Fennec City, with Mummion and Drekion curled up at the base of your bed, ecstatic to see you're okay as they go to kiss you in excitement. You then see Namid, who is excited to see you as well and runs into the other room to declare that you're okay, as Rui enters, and much to your surprise, with the hero of the second game, Pokemon XD Gale of Darkness, Michael behind her, with his Jolteon. As that's the evolution I decided fitted his personality most, as unlike the first game's protagonist Wes, who started with both Espeon and Umbreon already fully evolved, the second game's hero Michael started with an Eevee you could evolve however you saw fit. But given their connection to Professor Crane's lab and technology, I felt Jolteon made the most sense. It even fits Michael's design. I also decided to give Michael a combat, 
a Steel Fighting type Pokemon from my Firen region. And obviously I felt it would fit right at home in the Ori region being it's, well, a robot. This Combot would not only be a formidable battler just like his Jolteon, but help him perform various tasks in the lab. As would Jolteon as it would use its electricity to help power or jumpstart some of their devices. And of course Michael would also have Lugia on his team as Michael snagged a Shadow Lugia at the end of Gale of Darkness and it was purified in the Purified Chamber before it was destroyed in the events leading up to this game. Anyways, Michael apparently came to save you immediately after Rui reached out as he was already in the area as Professor Crane and him were investigating the meteor at Cosmic Crater. That's how you managed to escape. Michael and Jolteon stepped in to stop Twyla and all the Team Cypher goons, then flew you off Relgam Tower on the back of his now purified Lugia. Taking this all in and having an existential crisis, Zion says to themselves, I'm not real, just totally confused, as if they're malfunctioning. Rui tells you to look at your two Pokemon, Mummion and Drekion, laying at the bottom of the bed worried sick about you. That if you weren't real, would they love you like they do? Would you love them like you do? Zion then goes to hug Mummion and Drekion real tight, and then turns to Rui and says, You knew, all this time, you knew the truth about who or what I was, why didn't you say anything? Rui then says it's a lot more complicated than that. She says she was scared if they started to remember, that they'd remember the wrong things and fall back into their old programming. Without missing a beat, Zion says, old programming. Michael will then chime in and say, that is right. You, Zion, were created in the wrong hands as a weapon. Zion says, by who? And Michael says, by me. And Professor Crane. At least we were involved in the project. Michael says he unknowingly helped assist in Zion's creation, as he was led to believe Zion was being built to protect the Ori region of Shadow Pokemon ever resurfaced. Michael then points out that like Zion, he has a snag machine saying he too once used for good, as did another, referring to Wes. So he thought this was a good idea until he came to find that he was being manipulated after finding out about the meteorite made up of this dark substance and a device to attract it. After that, Michael was able to piece together his benefactor's real purpose for the Shadow Slayer. So he tells Zion he managed to sneak humanity into their programming as a failsafe, erasing the initial code intended for evil purposes entirely and installing real memories into his coding to further connect him to his humanity, then destroyed the lab claiming that the Shadow Slayer was destroyed with it. So as far as this mysterious benefactor was concerned, the Shadow Slayer was destroyed in this freak lab fire, and Michael and Professor Crane distanced themselves from the project. So these benefactors, knowing something was up, ended up destroying the Purify Chamber in Professor Crane's Pokemon HQ lab in retaliation for destroying the Shadow Slayer, something Rui has previously mentioned or alluded to before, but offering even more insight into this incident. And like Rui implied, this was also done as a way to ensure it couldn't be used against them, especially now that Michael and Crane are seemingly aware of their plans. Michael says they hid Zion away, so no one would know of their existence until the meteorite grew near. In which case Michael activated Zion, but was shocked to discover Zion somehow became sentient. Michael says there is no real logical explanation for it, and if there is, he's still stumped. Rui then confirms this, saying she can even read an aura off of Zion. But Ryolu then gets up on top of Zion, as it closes its eyes and puts its hand on Zion's heart, as if it's sensing their aura. Rui then says real sadly, that Zion is all that is left of Wes. As the room goes quiet and the tension is high, that is until Namid peeks her head back in, snacking on something real loud, asking what she missed, clearly not reading the room. Michael says he knows you probably have a lot of questions and they will answer them all, but they don't have time at the moment. The virus is spreading and more mutated Shadow Warp Pokemon like Shadow Trezor have been spotted throughout the region too, that they need your help stopping them. Zion starts to stand with the help of Mummion using its bandages to help hold them up. Zion then asks how they managed to purify Namid's Elgym. Rui says that there's a stone called the Relic Stone with the ability to purify Pokemon, originally found in a shrine to Celebi within Agati Village, but like the Purification Chamber has since been destroyed by an unknown organization, seemingly the same organization behind the creation of the Shadow Slayer, as they probably wanted to remove any obstacles that would stand in their way for whatever they had planned with this Dark Contagion on the meteor, which they seem to have attracted somehow. Rui then says, fortunately for them, there's another relic stone hidden here, in Fennec City, deep within the Fennec Catacombs, dedicated to the Wishmaker Jirachi. 
That's where she took Namid, as only a select few know about this more recently discovered shrine. Being as it's nighttime and no one is around, Rui will take you to the shrine hidden underneath the city's iconic water fountain as you start to decipher the ancient paintings on the wall, which seem to tell the origins of the first meteorite with the same virus that fell in the Ori region centuries ago, as what little remains of that dark substance that were unearthed is what eventually led to the Cypher's creation of Shadow Pokemon. So whoever is behind this meteorite crash clearly knew of the ancient stories and how the same darkness once descended upon the Ori region. Namid then says she's seen this same story before back in Aqueni village, the village her ancestors once called home, which is now basically kept up in honor of these people, almost like a museum. Zion then asks if her father, who runs the Totem Corporation in Neo Aquini, was able to help her at all, as she recently reached out to him while you went to investigate Relgam Tower. She said that his company was already looking into this meteorite and the Shadow Virus, that he actually asked her to bring Zion to his lab so they could meet and figure out a solution together. So the bustling and technologically advanced Neo Quenny, the largest city in the Ori region, created for this project would be your next destination, as that's where the Totem Headquarters, led by Namid's father Chatham, is located. But Michael provides you with a map with all of the mutated Shadow Warp Pokemon spotted throughout the region, some of which on your way to Neo Quinny, asking if you could help him combat these threats while en route. He then gives you a communicator so all of you can communicate with one another and stay updated. Michael then puts Jolteon back into its Pokeball and says they're going to search for Shadow Deoxys as it seems to be the biggest threat they are facing at the moment. So Michael lets Lugia out of its Pokeball and jumps on top of its back as they wish you good luck before taking to the sky in search of Shadow Deoxys. Now given this would be an open world game, I'm just gonna go in the order I think makes the most sense geographically. Taking a break from the more desert-esque settings we've seen so far. So why don't we venture out west to the more lush green areas which, by the way, although this map does feature a lot of the iconic locations from the Ori region, it doesn't feature a couple of the smaller locations, as they weren't really relevant to the story, and this is a more of an in-game map. Especially as this game does take a significant time jump between the last game in the series, Gale of Darkness, and given where that story left off, some of these locations just wouldn't make sense in the scope of the story, but that doesn't mean they aren't still there in the region, even if they are just collecting cobwebs. Now that we are off to greener pastures, let's start off with another iconic location in the Ori region, a gaudy forest, as well as the gaudy village found within this forest, which is swarming with a variety of new Pokemon and shadow Pokemon for you to snag. The Relic Cave would also even be back for you to explore. But now back to a gaudy forest, and more importantly a gaudy village, which is a lush green town of senior citizens with cozy tree-like buildings beside a majestic waterfall. In the first game, Pokemon Coliseum, it was revealed Rui's grandparents both live within this peaceful village. So after one of the mutated Shadow Warp Pokemon, a Shadow Slacking, from the forest goes on a rampage, disrupting this normally quiet village and threatening the older residents, most of which no longer capable of fending off such a foe, Rui asks you, aka Zion, to help protect her loved ones from this savage Pokemon. So this forest would be the location of your big boss battle against Shadow Slacking representing the Sin Sloth. You know, because it's a sloth. However, this Slacking is no slacker. In fact, it's a total beast in every sense, as I decided to make it more feral, taking inspiration from the infamous movie monster, King Kong, especially in its more intimidating and animated pose, with it standing up ready to throw down rather than laying down ready to take a nap. And while that's a mood, it wouldn't really make for an interesting boss battle. Now outside of the obvious darker color palette and blood red eyes, it has spiked up monster or villainesque hair and larger fangs to make it clear that this version isn't to be messed with. And while this shadow form does keep its signature ability hindering it in battle, as it can only attack every other turn, that's only because its already monster stats are even higher now. So it will be that much harder to deal with, especially as its stats allow it to really take a hit. It even has a new powerful signature shadow move, Shadow Smash, that will demolish defensive measures such as Protect, Light Screen, or Reflect, but of course it can't attack after using this move, so it goes right back to being slow and sloth-like for a turn. Despite representing sloth though, Shadow Slacking is actually quite savage, constantly jumping around from tree to tree to avoid your Pokemon's auto attacks, and crashing back down to unleash powerful attacks of its own with its fists. 
it would also rip some small trees out from the ground and throw them at you or your Pokemon, which would trigger some action commands that can do damage and set up the traditional turn-based 2 versus 2 battles. But the thing is, to honor its ability and the Sin Sloth, after each big attack, it will start to lounge around for a bit, giving you a chance to get some auto attacks in, as well as initiate the typical turn-based style sections again. Towards the end of this boss battle, after getting its health into the yellow, Shadow Slacking will swing on over to a gaudy village to terrorize the citizens, jumping home to home, destroying the wooden structures. At one point, it even goes to attack Rui's grandparents, but if you hit the action command button in time, Rui and Hiraiolu will step in to intercept it, as Hiraiolu evolves into a Lucario before your eyes, who is managing to hold off the much larger Shadow Slacking's fists. Another action command button will pop up, and if you hit it in time, her newly evolved Lucario will use an impressive force palm on Shadow Slacking, sending it flying, and even taking off a chunk of its health for you. It will then come charging at you, and in this time another action command will pop up, asking you to hit a button repeatedly as Lucario charges an Aura Sphere attack, and if you manage to hit the button fast enough before Slacking gets to you, it will launch doing even more damage and trigger in the turn-based style section so you can hopefully finish Shadow Slacking off and snag it. Now while this game is open world, there are a few moments within the story that you will have to do at certain points, and in a certain order. So next you'd have to head up north on your way to Neo Aquini to meet Namid's father. But first you'd make a pit stop to the original Aquini village, which is essentially a Native American reservation, as they preserved and maintained the original village Namid's ancestors once called home in order to honor its rich history in the Ori region. Namid will meet you here to show you some of the ancient drawings she remembers as a child, depicting the original meteorite that landed in the Ori region years ago, as she knew she recognized the drawings from the Fennec Catacombs from somewhere. So whoever else knew the shadow substance from this meteorite led to the creation of shadow Pokemon must be behind the plan to somehow attract this new shadow meteorite in an attempt to create more shadow Pokemon. So Namid is in full sleuthing mode. Anyways, there are plenty of unique Pokemon found around this reservation, and given the Midwest, which the Ori region is inspired by, has a lot of the same animal species as South America, there will even be a couple Pokemon from my third region, the Brazil-inspired Zoni region, including a brand new flying-type Evolution Avion. Normally evolved with a new stone known as the Sky Stone, typically found throughout the tropical Zoni region, where sky is the limit, and if you can dream it, you can do it. Avion is inspired by birds, as Brazil has such a wide variety of bird species. But I already have so many Pokemon planned for most of them in the Zoni region, so I chose to take most of its inspiration from Griffins, as I felt that just made sense for the design of a flying-type evolution, given it already has a similar body type. Plus, with my other two evolutions, Mummion being inspired by zombies, and Drekion being inspired by dragons, I wanted to stick in that theme with monsters for my evolutions. I also like my evolutions concepts to be somewhat generic in the sense that like all the other evolutions I want them to make sense and be found just about in any region. So I don't need them to be too specific to the region I introduced them in. But that being said, it's shiny's darker coloration is a reference to the harpy eagle found in Brazil which will have its own new Pokemon line in the Zoni region as it's the Zoni's regional bird. Speaking of eagles, the fact that the common depiction of griffins also resemble bold eagles was the cherry on top of the sundae for me as far as its design goes, as bold eagles are an American staple and fit perfectly for the Ori region's Arizona settings. As I always planned on introducing this new evolution in this project, as Pokemon Gale of Darkness introduced a couple Gen 4 Pokemon before they were revealed, not to mention Eevee is the starter Pokemon of these games and the Ori region. Namid says she knows this Avion, that it was once her father's starter Pokemon as he evolved it from an Eevee as a child. It likes to migrate to and from the Zoni region to play with other Avion, but always comes back to him around this time of year, which is unfortunate given the release of the Shadow Virus currently rampaging the region. But it works in your favor as you'd be able to snag the Shadow Pokemon and add it to your team before the release of the Zoni region's games. After snagging Shadow Avion, Namid will encourage you to purify it, saying her father will be thrilled to see his old companion, but she'd hate for him to see it like this. Namid then stops for a moment and says, Now that she thinks about it, why is it that your Mummion and Drekion haven't been infected by the Shadow Virus, especially after being exposed to all of these Shadow Pokemon? A little worried by this statement, Zion will use their Aura Reader to quickly scan their Pokemon 
only to see they are still perfectly fine. Zion says they aren't sure, then takes a moment to think, but that it is quite peculiar that if they were to have a guess given they were built as the Shadow Slayer to capture Shadow Pokemon by someone who clearly intended for this meteorite and virus to strike, it's likely they gave their Pokemon some sort of vaccination or immunity to the virus. Which by the way, Zion's theory is correct, that is exactly what happened, which will be confirmed and explained a little bit more later on in the game. Next, you'd head right next door to the mega metropolis known as Neo Aquini City to meet Namid's father, as I felt such a technologically advanced region, such as the Ori region, was really lacking a larger city. And I really liked the idea of connecting it to the Native American reservation to reflect the Totem Corporation's themes of using the past to build upon the future to show how far Namid and her father's family have come in the Ori region, as I wanted to avoid representing Native Americans in a stereotypical way, and I liked the symmetry and symbolism behind all of this. You'd be able to explore this massive metropolis with various shops and even its own coliseum with tournaments to participate in. There would be lots of electronic billboards with easter eggs to Pokemon regions throughout the Pokemon universe, including some of my own. You'd even be able to spot a giant movie billboard with a new Zony character and Pokemon on it. Hmm, I wonder who that could be. And who's that Pokemon? I don't know, it looks kind of familiar. While here, you'd also encounter Rui, who is shopping for a new dress for her Lucario, which grew out of its old dress after evolving. By the way, her special Ryolu and Lucario would be available as a special event Pokemon for Pokemon Brain and Pokemon Brawn, when connecting this game Pokemon Descent of Darkness. Anyways, of course you're here to meet Namid's father, Chatham, head of the Totem Corporation that is responsible for all of the Aura region's technological advancements and strides, a company that his father's father started decades ago and built from the ground up. And while he is very business oriented, and a workaholic, there is nothing more important to him than his family. As it is clear he loves his daughter, who idolizes him, and hopes to one day take over the Totem Corporation. So you'd head to Totem Tower, and after arriving you'd use Namid's personal keycard to take an impressive glass elevator up to one of the top floors straight to her father's equally as impressive private office and suite. With a gorgeous and nauseatingly high skyline view of the city, through an enormous floor-to-ceiling window right behind Chatham's desk. Namid is happy to see her father and finally introduce him to Zion, as she really hopes he can use his resources to help them stop the spread of this virus. She runs to give him a big hug, and he twirls her around and gives her a sweet kiss on her forehead. Talking fast, she's excited to tell him that she encountered his old Avion. Surprised, he smirks and then says, How rude of me, as he goes to greet Zion saying his daughter has only said nice things about them. He shakes Zion's hand, which is a little drawn out and somewhat awkward. Chatham then asks Namid if she could give him some time alone with the Shadow Slayer. Namid agrees, but before leaving the room, turns around and asks her father how he knew to call Zion that, as she's never used that name to describe Zion while discussing them with her father. Zion, now on alert, lets out Mummion and Drekion as they know something is up. Chatham makes a comment about how his daughter is too smart for her own good and that he'd hope it wouldn't come to this, but says not to resist and make things any more difficult than they have to be, as he challenges you to a Pokemon battle. Like most of the trainer battles in this game, this would be a double battle. Chatham would even have a Shadow Bufalant on his team for you to snag. After the battle, Chatham would confess that the Totem Corporation were the ones who funded the creation not only of the Shadow Slayer, aka Zion, but the device that attracted the Cosmic Meteor as well, knowing very well that it would carry this dark contagion. But Chatham Ashamed promises his daughter he only ever did it to protect her and the rest of their family, as the real mastermind behind this operation and reforming Cypher promised their family would be protected after the fallout in exchange for all of their funding and resources and that he pretty much had no real choice because he was told that him and the Totem Corporation could either comply and decide to be on the winning team, or Cypher would take what they wanted by force and he'd lose everything. So Chatham really isn't a bad guy and only did what he thought was best for his family. Namid, clearly upset with her father, says that doesn't make it alright. Chatham calling her his sweet angel 
says that she is so naive and that in the grand scheme of things, there is no such thing as right or wrong, good or evil, just life or death. And he chose life, as there is just way too much at stake. He then says he hopes she can forgive him one day and maybe might even understand. Namid, disappointed, says it's not too late to make it right. He can help them by stopping Cypher and the spread of the virus. He then says he pretty much just helped fund and keep the lights on for this newly reformed Cypher Corporation, and that he really isn't privileged to that kind of knowledge. But having you come here was a setup as they wanted to capture the Shadow Slayer now that they know it isn't destroyed. So right after Namid told him about Zion, he instantly knew she was talking about the Shadow Slayer given the details within her story which correlated with what he's been told. So he promised to deliver Zion to Cypher who is now threatening his daughter as someone in Cypher managed to snag some photos of Namid with Zion while in Fennec City. Too upset to even look at her father any longer, holding back her tears, Namid apologizes to Zion for unknowingly putting them in this situation. Mummion then uses one of its bandages to help wipe her tears, and the normally distant Drekion lets down its guard and snuggles up against her leg to help comfort her as well. Namid then says they have to leave immediately. Chatham begs his daughter not to go, saying that she'd be making a big mistake if she chose a mere robot over her own flesh and blood. Namid Emotional then says that Zion is more of a man than he will ever be. And before she can say any more, there's a loud explosion in the city. The three of them and Mummion and Drekion all then rush to the window to see what is up. And it turns out it was Shadow Deoxys who has returned, now in its attack form, flying around aimlessly destroying the city for reasons unknown. Zion then looks down at Mummion and Drekion as they all nod in agreement. They have to stop it before anyone else is hurt. But before they can do anything else, they then see Michael in the distance riding on top of their Lugia flying towards Shadow Deoxys to try to take it down. There is then a massive cinematic cutscene of Michael riding Lugia battling Shadow Deoxys in its attack form throughout the city, flying around buildings and streets. Deoxys will use its DNA arms to hurl cars at Lugia. Windows would be shattered as they fly across or up them in the struggle. Buildings would be destroyed, plenty of explosions. In fact, some of these moments would even have action commands so you'd be involved. Although the fight would take them to Totem Tower and Shadow Deoxys would stop mid-fight immediately after spotting Zion through the window. As there would be a cool horizontal shot of Shadow Deoxys floating outside one side of the window with Zion inside the skyscraper looking right at it, paralleling each other. Lugia will then fly towards Shadow Deoxys trying to continue the fight, but Shadow Deoxys would use its strands to hurl Lugia away as it stops everything and diverts its attention to Zion bursting through the massive skyscraper window. There'd then be a brief shot of Michael on Lugia, injured but clearly okay. You'd all run out of Chatham's office into the massive hallways of the Totem facility with several labs behind glass walls. From here your battle against Shadow Deoxys in its attack form would begin, taking you through the Totem facility into various lab rooms as your fight would shatter various glass and other structures throughout the tower. Now unlike your last fight against Shadow Deoxys, this isn't a tutorial battle, and being that it is in its attack form, it's ready to annihilate you. So prepare for a challenging battle, and while you can use your auto attacks to weaken it outside of the normal turn-based sections of the battle, I'd avoid it altogether as its attacks in this form and the overworld do a lot of damage and are relentless. It really likes to use its tentacle arms and whip them around and extend them. You can even hide behind various lab equipment or structures throughout the building. And with the red security sirens in the tower blaring as this fight would be going on, there would be a very horror-esque element to this fight, especially in the more cinematic parts with the action command buttons, many of which were Drekion would go feral or Mummion would use its bandages to throw beakers or lab equipment at Shadow Deoxys to try to buy Zion some time to run. After weakening Shadow Deoxys enough that its HP is in the yellow, the fight would end up on the rooftop of Totem Tower where Chatham and Namid are boarding a private helicopter. Namid is screaming out from the helicopter, trying to get you on board, 
and saying not to leave you, but her father Chatham tells the pilot to take off immediately. Still on the rooftop, you'd continue your battle against Shadow Deoxys as there would be an Action Command segment where Shadow Deoxys would wrap its strands around the helicopter tail and destroy it and the tail blade, causing it to start plummeting from the sky with Namid and Chatham still on board. Luckily, Lugia, with Michael still riding on it, would use its feet to grab hold of the burning chopper and bring them to safety on the rooftop. Michael still on Lugia's back would then throw a Pokeball, releasing Jolteon on the helicopter pad to help him fight. As you'd then have a series of even more cinematic action commands, being able to attack as Lugia flies around Shadow Deoxys, executing a series of powerful attacks at the same time as Mummion, Drekion, and even Jolteon, as you're all teaming up against it. And each of these action commands would do a chunk of damage and end the battle as Shadow Deoxys' health is already low. After defeating Shadow Deoxys, it would quickly swoop down and grab Lugia, with Michael still on its back, soaring into the sky while extending its tentacle-like arms around Lugia and squeezing tightly to the point Lugia can no longer use its wings. Lugia is struggling to break free, and Michael is struggling to hold on as they are going higher and higher into the atmosphere above the city. A dark shadow energy is then released from Shadow Deoxys' tentacles directly into Lugia, who then closes its eyes and stops struggling. The screen goes black for a second, and then it will cut to Lugia opening its eyes, which are now bloodshot red, as it has once again transformed into Shadow Lugia after being infected by Shadow Deoxys. Shadow Deoxys then retracts its tentacles, freeing Shadow Lugia from its grasp as the two stare at each other high above in the sky as if they are in agreement or somehow communicating telepathically. Michael, still on Lugia's back, terrified, pleads to his Lugia to fend off the darkness, saying that it's defeated it before. But Shadow Lugia, who turns its head to look back at its trainer, then with zero hesitation, throws Michael off of it, as Zion, Namid, and the three Evolutions all watch both in shock and devastation far below on the helicopter pad as Michael helplessly starts plummeting to his doom. 